So the same session, um, about 25 minutes on from the livestock chasing dog, which is, is you know, um, until he's proved himself consistently otherwise. He's to be treated as though a dog, he's a dog that chases livestock, so adequate care needs to be taken with him. Um, and certainly more training needs to be done with him. But if I can just spin around here and just show, there he is. And, um, same dog that we've seen earlier, enjoying an off-lead walk amongst livestock without getting any correction whatsoever. How stressless is that? And all I would ask is that there are plenty of people that claim to be able to um, employ methods which are more humane and are kinder to the dog and don't involve anything in terms of punishment or correction. But I would just ask for results. I would like to see a confirmed chaser by any of those people, any any person would win my credibility if you can show me a confirmed chaser before and afterwards employing alternative methods. So I'm just going to whistle him back now. Archie! Good lad. So there's loads of running sheep there now, look. Good. But he's in for the recall. Good boy! And this is the first time that he's heard the whistle um, today. I've not used a whistle with him, but basically because I haven't um, done any training with him before. So, but the whistle has been paired with low level stimulation, um, but the whistle has been paired as such that it's able to predict the occurrence or non-occurrence of that low level stimulation, which basically gives the young dog choice. And training is all about choice rather than enforcement um, and rigidity. It is important that he or she is able to make up their own mind in response to a trained signal as to whether they choose to respond to that signal or not. Now the consequences can be negative, or the consequences can be positive, the consequences can be neutral. That's down to the individual um, trainer and their choice of training, or, or whether or not they deem it necessary to include a, a correction or indeed a reward. But the important thing is that what you become is um, an indicator for the dog. You become somebody who's able to say it's safe, it's unsafe, it's rewarding, it's not rewarding. Um, so in that case, what actually happens is the bond between the handler and the dog increases. I mean, I'm sat here now, here he is, um, he's off lead, the sheep there, you know, it's the first time I've been out with him. But what happens is that the, the bond between the handler and the dog increases because the dog listens out for you and looks to you for guidance and for direction. It doesn't look to you for um, punishment because nothing comes from you um, it can look to you for reward the dog can look to you for reward and so it should do you know and the reward doesn't necessarily or should never really simply be the cessation of an unpleasant consequence you know reward should be something tangible um, built up with the dog whether that's a toy or praise or food or but many dogs when they're in that high level of drive anybody who trains them would know food goes out the window toys can come in because they kick into the prey drive um, but food goes out the window because you know, stand before you're about to get on a roller coaster and see if you fancy a burger, and it's highly unlikely if you're in any way uh, excited or anxious about what you're about to experience. And so, with a dog that's got prey drive and that prey drive is in mode, um, food won't cut it because basically the adrenaline's pumping, the dog's ready to go or he's already going, um, and it's pointless, absolutely pointless and futile trying to call the dog back with food. Toys can do it, as I say, because you're channeling the chase onto a chase. But the fact is that you need to be able to terminate that initial chase in the first place, which is where e-collars come into their own. There, there is nothing else, or remote spray collars, there's nothing else um, available worldwide that is able to offer that level of confidence in, in the handler and that level of reliability in um, the timing and the intensity and the duration of any correction that you wish to put in there to be able to humanely teach your dog uh, in the most effective manner possible. And when you look at the term humane, you know, if you want to Google it or whatever, but humane basically comes up as meaning um, with the minimum of pain. Now, there is no pain. An e-collar used in this matter, manner doesn't cause any pain, it causes startle, because pain has to come from an injury or an illness. You know, it has to be something that is lasting. If I prick my finger on, on a nail, um, if that my finger throbs afterwards, or is bleeding afterwards, and it's sore afterwards, then that's pain. If I prick my finger on the nail and, it, and uh, it's instantly gone, the sensation is gone, well that isn't necessarily pain, that's more that it's startling. And this is where um, uh, there's a huge um, misunderstanding about um, the use of remote collars um, and their, um, the way that they equate to pain. And, and they can do, of course they can do, of course you can remain, you know, keep something on so it lasts for a duration, it becomes painful. Yes you can, but the same is true of a flat collar and a dog that runs towards the end of a, a flexible training and hits a flat collar that 
consequently hurts the dog's neck. That's pain. You know, um, halties, put a haltie on a dog, a gentle leader, a canny collar, a dogmatic, anything like that, and you get a dog that's pulling and pulling and pulling, and it can take the, the harness off, and you end up with the marks around the dog's face. That can be pain. You know, there's, there's, it, it's not about the tool. You know, it's, it's about the manner in which the tool is used. And if the tool is used in a humane manner, and it's a, used with a, a definite goal, and the definite goal is to achieve a desired outcome, and that that's incrementally achieved through successive planning of how you're going to get there, then you're not setting out to hurt dogs. You know, and what you end up with is a young lad like that, sat there changing away on a stick, perfectly happy, with livestock all over him. Well, 25 minutes ago, he was whacking at the end of his flexi lead to try and chase them. You know, you can only you can only um, talk so much. You know, and then you, you've got to show it. You've got to be able to show um, whether what you're saying is true and whether it's achievable. Um, and I say I was one of the biggest opponents of, of um, electric collars. You know, I, I thought spray collars too. You know, I thought they were inhumane. I thought they were barbaric until I fully understood what it was all about. Um, and and the um, humane use of those tools and now I consider them to be the most humane um, tra not in not in teaching a new behavior you know if you want to teach a new behavior then I would go um, mark reward all the way you know clicker um, verbal verbal marking and rewarded all the way absolutely but when you're talking about modifying a, an existing behavior so something which in itself is rewarding or intrinsically rewarding to the dog something which the dog does for the sake of doing it such as chasing livestock you cannot you cannot eradicate that without there being a negative consequence thus changing the dog's mindset towards performing that behavior in the first place if i perform a behavior and it's permanently rewarding for me and permanently rewarding for me and you restrict me and prevent me from doing it and a lot of behavior modification is prevent uh, preventative measures but the second that restriction comes away i'm bang straight back to what i was doing before because it's got no other consequence for me than positive okay you might have been able to stop me from doing it but that doesn't mean that it's not rewarding uh, uh, not self-rewarding uh, anymore and the only way, the only possible way that you can do that is to, to change the consequence, to change the outcome, to change the expected outcome in the mind of the dog for performing that behaviour. Once you've done that and you then reinforce an incompatible behaviour or an alternative behaviour, you will have a dog who no longer wants to do what he was doing before. So he no longer wants to chase sheep, she no longer wants to chase sheep because the whole consequence, the whole thought process as in A, B, C, D and what happens at the end of it changes and it becomes not worthwhile for the dog to do it. Sorry about that.